Okay, thank you very much, Professor Bloom. It really is a pleasure to come and lecture to you today on Valentine's Day on the topic of love. Uh, my main area of research uh, is human emotion, and uh, love is an emotion. It's not one that I study personally, at least not in the lab, and, um, uh, but it is fun to talk about, and it is a, a topic that lends itself to many social psychological uh, phenomena. Uh, it's also great to be able to come in and guest lecture. One of the things I very much miss uh, since serving as dean is the opportunity to teach Psychology 110. And although I love being dean, I do miss uh, teaching introductory psychology. Uh, the feeling of uh, exposing people to uh, uh, ideas that maybe you hadn't heard before. Well, I suspect some of the ideas in this talk you'll have not heard before, uh, and for a variety of reasons. A Couple of the things you'll notice is that some of the experiments I'll talk about today are not the kinds of experiments that can be done anymore. They're not considered uh, ethically acceptable, but they were done in the 50s and 60s and early 70s when uh, uh, ethical standards were different. And um, uh, so we can teach them, we just can't give you the same experiences that some of the college students uh, that we'll talk about today in these studies had. The other thing I will mention is that there is a certain um, uh, androcentric and heterosexual quality to much of the social psychological research uh, on romantic love. Uh, you'll see that in the experiments, usually the participants are men and usually the targets are uh, women in these experiments. I'm not endorsing this as the only way to study love, it just happens to be the way these experiments were done. And so I, I, I mentioned this caution uh, right from the beginning. We'll have to think about, one of the things you should think about is do you think these experiments generalize to other uh, kinds of dyadic uh, relationships? Uh, and uh, that's a question that I think you can, you, you can ask throughout this lecture. Okay, so let's get started. And uh, to start uh, things off, uh, I think what we need to do is consider uh, a definition. I'm going to define what love is, but then most of the experiments I'm going to talk about are really focused more on attraction than love. Who finds each other uh, of romantic interest um, that might then develop into a love uh, relationship? But let's start with a definition of love, and I'm going to pick a definition from a former colleague, uh, Robert Sternberg, who is now the dean uh, at uh, Tufts University, but was here on our, our faculty at Yale for nearly uh, 30 years or so. And uh, he has a theory of love that argues that it's made up of three components, intimacy, passion, and commitment, or what is sometimes called decision commitment. And these are relatively straightforward. He argued that you don't have love if you don't have all three of these uh, elements. Intimacy is the feeling of closeness, of connectedness with someone, of bonding. Operationally, you could think of intimacy as you share secrets, you share information with this person that you don't share with anybody else. Okay? That's really what intimacy is. The bond that comes from sharing information that isn't shared with, other, with many other people. Second uh, element uh, is passion. Passion is what you think uh, it, it is. Uh, passion is, uh, uh, the we, we would say, the drive that leads to romance. You can think of it as physical attraction or sex. And um, Sternberg argues that uh, this is a required uh, component uh, of a love relationship. It is not, however, a required component of taking a shower in Calhoun College. The third, <laughs> the third element of love in Sternberg's theory is what, what he calls decision or commitment. The decision that one is in a love relationship, the willingness to label it as such, and a commitment to maintain that relationship, at least for some period of time. Sternberg would argue, it's not love if you don't call it love, and if you don't have some desire to maintain the relationship. So if you have all three of these 
Intimacy, passion, and commitment, in Sternberg's theory, you have love. Now, what's interesting about the theory is what do you have if you only have one out of three, or two out of three? Uh, what, what do you have and how is it different if you have a different two out of three? Uh, uh, these are, what, what's um, interesting about this kind of theorizing is it, give, it gives rise to many different permutations that when you break them down and start to uh, look at them carefully can be quite interesting. So what I've done is I've taken uh, Sternberg's three elements of love, intimacy, passion, and commitment, and I've listed out the different kinds of relationships one would have if you had zero, one, two, or three out of the three elements. And I'm using names or types that Sternberg uses in his theory. These are really from him. Some of these are pretty obvious. If you don't have intimacy, if you don't have passion, if you don't have commitment, you don't have love. Uh, Sternberg calls this non-love. That's the technical term. And um, uh, essentially what he's saying is, uh, the relationship you now have to the person sitting next to you, presuming that you're sitting next to a random person that you didn't know from uh, your college, uh, is probably non-love. If it's something else, we can talk about it at the end of the lecture, uh, or perhaps when I get to it in a moment. Now, let's start to add elements. Let's add intimacy. This is uh, sharing uh, secrets, a feeling of closeness, connectedness, bonding. Let's say we have that with someone, but we don't have passion, that is no sexual arousal, and no commitment to maintain the relationship. This is liking, Sternberg calls it liking. And liking is really uh, uh, what is happening in most typical friendships. Not your closest friendship, but friendships uh, of, uh, of a casual kind. You feel close, you share certain information with that person that you don't share with other, many other people, but you're not physically attractive, and there's no particular commitment to maintaining this uh, for a long period of time. Now, what if you're not intimate, you're not committed, but you're passionate? You feel that sexual arousal. This uh, is what uh, uh, Sternberg would call infatuation, and that term probably works for you too, infatuated love. And uh, this is love at first sight. I don't know you. We've never shared any secrets because I don't know you. I'm not, com I'm not committed to defining this as anything. I'm not committed to the future. In fact, I'm not thinking about the future. I'm thinking about right now. But boy, am I attracted. Right? That's, that's, that's infatuation. And that's what Sternberg means by infatuated love. The third kind of uh, one element relationship is there's no intimacy, right? No bonding, no closeness, no secrets, no physical attraction, no sexual arousal, but by gosh, we are going to maintain this relationship. We are committed to it uh, for all time. <coughs> Sturmer calls that empty love. Empty love is kind of interesting. Um, it's often the final stage of long-term relationships that have gone bad. We don't share information with each other anymore, so there's no intimacy. We don't feel physically attracted to each other anymore. There's no passion. But we'd better stay together for the kids, right? Or we'd better stay together for appearances' sake. Or we'd better stay together because financially it would be a disaster if we don't. Or all the reasons other than intimacy and passion that people might commit to each other, that's what Sternberg calls empty love. Now what's interesting is in societies where marriages are arranged, this is often the first stage of a, of a love relationship. These two people who've maybe never seen each other before, who have never shared secrets, so there's no intimacy, who have never, don't know if they're physically attracted to each other, are on their wedding day revealed to each other and committed legally and sometimes religiously uh, to each other, right? The commitment is there, but at that moment, nothing else might be there. What's interesting, of course, is that such relationships don't seem to have any greater chance of ending in divorce. 
than people who marry for love. But there's a big confound, there's a big problem in studies of those kind of relationships. What, what might it be? Anybody? What might be the problem in the statement I just made that these kind of relationships are just as likely to survive as people who marry for love? Yes? Yeah, so they, 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 they may occur, they're more likely to occur in societies that frown on divorce, that make it very costly, uh, socially costly, uh, to divorce. So uh, they may stay together for all kinds of reasons, not always such good ones. All right, now, um, who, was it, uh, who was it who sang the song, uh, Two Out of Three Ain't Bad? Is that Meatloaf? <laughs> who was it? It was Meatloaf. All right, Professor Bloom, if Professor Bloom says it was Meatloaf, it was Meatloaf. You're all saying there was a singer called Meatloaf? <laughs> I, I, um, Meatloaf sang the song, Two Out of Three Ain't Bad. Let's see if two out of three ain't bad. What if you have uh, intimacy, we share secrets, passion, we feel physically uh, attracted to each other, but we're not making any commitments here. Sturmberg calls that romantic love. This is uh, physical attraction with close bonding, but no commitment. Romeo and Juliet, when they first met. Uh, this is often the way relationships uh, start. We like each other. I'm physically attracted to each other, I enjoy, uh, to you. I enjoy spending time with you, but I'm not making any long-term commitments here. I'm not even willing to use the L word in describing uh, what it is we have, right? Many of you might have been in relationships of this sort. That's, that's romance. That's romantic love. Now, what if you have intimacy? We share uh, secrets with each other, but there's no particular physical attraction but we are really committed to this relationship. This is what Sternberg calls companionate love. This is your best friend. We are committed to sharing intimacy, to being friends forever, but f physical attraction is not part of the equation here. Uh, this is sort of the, uh, maybe the Greek ideal uh, in uh, relationships of some kind. All right, what if we have passion, I'm sexually attracted to you, but no intimacy, I don't want to really know that much about you, I don't want to really share anything of me with you, but I am committed to maintaining this physical attraction to you. <laughs> well, that's uh, what Sturmberg calls fatuous love. It's a whirlwind courtship, it's a Hollywood romance, it might lead to a shotgun wedding, maybe you find yourself in Las Vegas and you get married for a day and a half and, uh, and then realize that this wasn't such a good idea, and, Maybe your name is Brittany and you're a singer. Well, anyway, you get the, <laughs> you get the idea. Uh, that's, that's fatuous love. Uh, we, are, we are basically committed to each other for sex, but it, it's very hard to make those relationships last a long time because we might not have anything in common. We might not share anything with each other. We might not trust each other. We're not particularly bonded uh, to each other. On the other hand, if you have all three, intimacy, passion, commitment, this is consummate love, uh, according to Sturberg, complete love. This is how he defines love. Okay, so now you have a definition of love, and you can now, uh, as a homework assignment, uh, sit down tonight and make a list of every person you know <laughs> by the three uh, elements of love and just start putting the check marks in the boxes and tallying up your personal love box score. And uh, we don't want to collect those, we don't even want to see those, but um, you can have fun with that. Then you can ask the other people to do it too, and you can compare with each other. And uh, you know, if you all survive this exercise, you'll be better for it. You know, but what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That's the idea behind that exercise.